so uh, we will start. Uh, welcome everybody for the um, for the start of the second semester. And uh, we have an exciting seminar series this semester. Again, following with the uh, Corona regulations, we are hosting people from um, Timeline New York to Timeline um, China, I think. Well, I don't think that we have China this year, but this semester. But anyway, we are hosting several uh, time zones. Um, and today we are hosting Chantel Nixon, Dr. Chantel Nixon from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim, Norway. Um, Chantel earned her PhD in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta in Canada. Over there, she reconstructed glacial and relative sea level changes in Western Canadian high Arctic. Following her PhD, she moved to the east coast of Canada where she was employed as a coastal geologist for the Nova Scotia Geological Survey. After moving back, after moving to Trondheim in Norway, in August 20, um, 2015, she worked for the Geological Survey of Norway in the Marine Geology Group, mapping submarine glacial geomorphology sediments and gas seeps in, in the Barents Sea. Since 2018, she has been employed as an associate professor at the Department of Geography and NTNU. She is still in the early stages of starting up her research program after transitioning from government geological surveys to academia. But her research program so far includes reconstructing paleoenvironment change in Arctic coastal environment and mapping the sources, transport pathways and sink for microplastics in Arctic fjords. So today we are hosting Chantel and she is going to talk on quantitative quantifying past and future sea level changes in Norway. So thank you very much, everybody. And Chantel, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks, Bev, for putting my name forward and, and Nicholas for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm very honored to speak to you today. Um, I guess you did a really good job of introducing me uh, because I was going to say all of that. But uh, so I'll just start with the, the photo on the slide. Um, we're actually looking out at the Barents Sea here. This is in northernmost Norway where I visited last summer and it, this area is also a part of um, the project that I'm going to describe today. Uh, I was just there on holidays, but I'm standing on a raised beach. Um, this beach is from the Younger Dryas period, um, around 12, 11,000 years before present, and I'm looking down, or we're looking down on um, lower raised beaches um, down to the modern beach, which is right full of plastic, I have to say, and also driftwood. And then there are raised beaches extending back. So this talk is really about past sea level change and records of past sea level change in Norway and how they can help us with projections or improving projections for future, um, mostly relative sea level rise in, in Norway. But I won't actually be talking too much about raised beaches. I'm gonna talk about other records of, of sea level and coastal change. But um, as, uh, as I was introduced, I'm sort of like an old early career researcher. So this is my first, this talk, um, I decided to present you something that's in its early stages. So I don't have a really nice tidy story to share with you, unfortunately, but I'd like to share with you this project, which was funded last year and our plans and some of the questions and hypotheses we'd like to test and, and the, the relevance of those questions, answering those questions. So, and this is in partnership with colleagues at the Geological Survey of Norway, um, a couple of Canadian universities and um, the University of Bergen. And, and I'll get to those partners at the end, but I will begin. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, so the presentation, this is our logo or quanti logo or quantifying uh, past, present and future sea level change in Norway. We, we got the funding last year. It's my first big project funding, so I'm excited about it. Uh, it's really fun to, as an early career researcher to have finally have money to do something. So, um, but the presentation will discuss what we know about past, present and future sea level in Norway now. What are the quantity objectives and a little bit about how far we've come with respect to recent uh, relative sea level change and past transgression events in Norway and then a, li 
uh, actually not so much about the future, but maybe the relevance, let's say. Okay, so um, if you want to talk um, about past sea level change um, in a country like Norway, you must understand a little bit about the glacial history of Norway. And when I say past sea level change, I'm really only going back to the last glacial maximum, which is represented on this map here. These, uh, the white lines are um, former ice sheet margins um, dating to the last glacial maximum. For these three big coalesced um, ice sheets, the Scandinavian ice sheet um, in the middle, which covered Norway, um, the uh, Svalbard Barentskara ice sheet to the north and the British Irish ice sheet to the southwest. And then you can see Greenland's uh, and Iceland's uh, ice sheet margins also extended um, offshore. They're larger than they are today. So if we zoom in a little bit more on, um, on Norway, you can see um, that the last glacial maximum ice sheet extended right to the continental slope. And then um, around, uh, by around 15,000 years, almost everywhere in coastal Norway, not coastal Scandinavia, but in coastal Norway, that ice sheet margin was onshore. And what that means is that relative sea, we can start recording or we start to see evidence of relative former relative sea level stands. Once that ice is out of the way, we can start creating shorelines. And so that's where the story begins here for this for the Quansi project when we're looking to the past. Um, and of course, uh, if we're, this is important because of something called glacial isostatic adjustment or GIA. And I really hope I'm not pitching this, um, you know, at the wrong level here. I wasn't exactly sure who'd be in the audience, but I understand there are students. So I'm going to explain some of the, the basic concepts. And one of those is glacial isostatic adjustment. And so what I'm showing here is just a model of a big ice sheet. So that's the dashed blue line on the left of the diagram that says T1. And there is going to be some sea level associated at that time. Um, but as that ice sheet um, melts away, um, or sorry, when you have that big ice sheet sitting on a landmass, it's depressing the Earth's crust and displacing some of the upper mantle. Um, and so that causes a higher um, local relative sea level simply because you've, you've lowered the landmass and you allow the sea to, to flow in. Um, but once um, you melt away some of that ice sheet, we get a crustal rebound or glacioisostatic adjustment, which is positive uh, vertical uplift of the crust. And so, um, so then when we're starting to deposit these coastal landforms, I've got a schematic below now showing the ice sheet margin, uh, dumping out all kinds of meltwater and sediments uh, into a shallow basin, um, creating these shorelines. And eventually as that ice sheet melts away and we get more and more uh, glacial isostatic adjustment or crustal uplift, we're left behind with things like the beach ridges that I showed you the picture of, or these raised marine deltas and many other records of higher relative sea levels. Um, and glacial isostatic adjustment is really the main driver of, of past sea level change in Norway because we, we were glaciated, um, fully glaciated 22,000 years ago. Um, and so that's not the only impact or driver of, of relative sea level change, but it is the most important. But I'll just say very quickly um, here, um, I think you were looking at, yeah, you were looking at the lower figure in, in the, the, the previous slide. Um, there, there's all, there are also uh, gravitational effects um, that impact sea levels. So when we have a big ice sheet, we have um, increased gravitational attraction to that ice sheet, which raises a sea level locally um, towards that, that big ice mass sitting on the land. And when it melts, um, it has less gravitational attraction to itself. And so local sea level um, lowers or, or um, and this can be on, um, I think up to 10 meter sort of scale. So it's, it's significant. Um, and then we also have our increased ocean water mass and that is simply related to um, melt water entering the oceans or water being taken out of the oceans and locked up in ice sheets and ice caps and glaciers. 
And so these three effects plus a whole bunch of other little ones all add up to rel relative sea level change over time. Um, but there are a couple of, um, yeah, so there are a couple of other events um, after de or during the post-glacial period since the, since the last glacial maximum that are important for understanding uh, relative sea level change in Norway. And, and the first one is the Younger Dryas Stadial. This was this um, sudden switch to um, glacial, a glacial-like climate again during the overall deglaciation of the big ice sheets um, like the Scandinavian ice sheet. And it occurred around 12,700 years before present to 11,500 years before present. And the map um, on the right is showing you the, the big moraine systems that extend uh, from north to south in, in Norway. Um, and they outline um, when the ice sheet sort of, uh, well, it either re-advanced or it, or it uh, stopped retreating and it deposited these big moraines. And it also, impacted relative sea level change because that crustal, rapid crustal rebound that occurs after deglaciation sort of paused here. In some areas, it caused a transgression. In other areas, it caused a stillstand. And in other areas still, it just caused a slowdown in, in the forced regression following deglaciation. So, so this is an important event also in the sea level, uh, post-glacial sea level records of Norway. And then we have one more called the Tapas transgression. And that occurred between around 10,000 and 7,000 years before present. Um, it had a one to two meter to over 20 meter amplitude. Um, and it was probably caused by the changing balance of eustatic um, and, and glacial or geo drivers of relative sea level, but we don't really understand it because it, it's pretty unusual. And you'll see that in some of the sea level curves that I'm gonna show you. But the map on the left is, is showing you current rates of um, geo or vertical um, crustal rebound, I guess. Um, in millimeters per year. So along the coast right now, it's, it's uplifting between one and five millimeters per year. And the dots um, indicate all of the sites where relative sea level has been reconstructed and the tapas transgression is, um, is recorded in that, that relative sea level history at that site. Okay, so um, those are the big events um, in Norway that impacted post-glacial sea level change. And here we've got um, a, a map with um, the marine limits. So the highest level, the highest post-glacial shoreline um, or deglacial and post-glacial shorelines in Norway. And you can see that the, under the thickest part of the former Scandinavian ice sheet, which is around um, north central Sweden and Finland, uh, marine limits are more than uh, 250 meters above present sea level, uh, and they go all the way down to around zero on some parts of the coast. But in general, I just wanted to show you the different shapes of the relative sea level curves um, for Norway. A lot of them show this, um, this forced, rapid forced regression due to this strong um, geo driver. Uh, of, of relative sea level change, forcing that regression um, down, right down to, to modern sea level. But then you can also see in, in some of these curves, the impact of the Younger Dryas and the Tapas transgression, um, where you see this inflection point in the curve and a, and a transition from falling sea level or low stand to rising sea level. So I just want to zoom in on a couple of those. And the reason why I want to do this is, is just to um, help you understand our rationale for some of the objectives of the Quancy project. So we'll start in Trondheim, where I'm talking to you from today. Um, and this is a relative sea level. Uh, I've got source there. Sorry, <laughs> I forgot to put the source in. Um, but I've got a relative sea level curve um, for just out a little, little more towards the coast from, from Trondheim itself. And you can see around 12, 11,000 years before present, the impact of the Younger Dryas event that has not caused a transgression in this part of Norway, but it has um, caused a stillstand. And we have absolutely beautiful Younger Dryas shorelines around 160 meters above sea level here. 
um, either eroded into bedrock or um, they're represented by enormous um, deltas. Um, but following the Younger Dryas, we have this very um, steep, um, rapidly um, falling relative sea level. And then around the time of the Tapas transgression, that slows down. We don't get an actual transgression here uh, because of the rates of rebound at that time countering that transgression. But we certainly get a slowdown and it just falls all the way to modern. But from about 2000 years before present to, to present day, there's no data constraining this curve. Um, and likewise, we go a little bit farther south. Here, we've actually got a low stand offshore around 9,000 radiocarbon years before present based on a kind of sketchy data and no, um, no sea level index points constraining the curve from, from the mid Holocene to present. Um, and then uh, another example from farther south and west, um, a really nice relative sea level curve um, that has uh, recorded both of the transgressions that I discussed the, related to the Younger Dryas, Geochron, and to the Tapas transgression. Um, but again, not um, kind of low resolution data constraining this curve and particularly in the last 2000 years. Um, okay. Yeah, and then in the south we've got um, a lot of the curves from the south, we have this mid Holocene high stand. Um, but again, um, I just want to highlight the lack of data in, in the constraining the curve in general, but especially in the last 2000 years or so. Okay, so now I'm just going to say a quick word about how most of these relative sea level curves have been reconstructed in Norway. Um, we use here and it's a, there's a long tradition of using the isolation basin. Uh, relative sea level reconstruction method. And it's excellent um, because we often have these beautiful bedrock sills um, to get a very precise uh, elevation uh, on for, for our sea level index point. And also our cores are full of organic material that we can radiocarbon date. So we can, we can date, we can create fairly precise sea level index points. Um, but I'll talk about the pros and cons of this method in a moment. I'll just explain quickly how it works in case you don't know. Um, so in the panel on the left, I have before isolation, I've got an isolation basin that's fully submerged. So this is when the crust was depressed due to that former ice sheet loading. And in that basin, um, marine sediments are, are accumulating. And then as the GIA uh, progresses or in crustal uplift um, occurs, uh, and as that sill, which is the margin of the basin, as it reaches the intertidal zone, our basin becomes um, more brackish and anoxic, and we start depositing these so-called isolation sediments or brackish sediments on top of the marine sediments. And then finally, once we reach full isolation, our sill is ab above the intertidal zone. Um, our basin becomes a lake, uh, a freshwater lake or a pond and maybe eventually um, a bog. Um, and, and those uh, freshwater sediments are deposited. And the amazing thing about this method, I think, is that it's, it's so visually obvious. Um, this is a Russian core on, in the photo on the right. You know exactly when you've hit that isolation contact because you can see it. So we've got these, these bright um, or light gray marine clays followed by this sort of brownish, greenish, brackish layer, and then often a layered freshwater um, package of sediments overlying that. And it's, it's really the same everywhere. And like I said, there's lots of organic matter in these cores, so we can date them really well. And as long as the sill is bedrock and not buried by beach sediments or, or other um, overburden, then um, we, uh, we can get a really strong or precise sea level index point from this kind of data. But you can usually only get one sea level index point per basin. So you need a lot of basins to um, build a sea level curve with, and they all have to be within the same area located roughly on the same isobase. Um, and that can be a challenge sometimes. And that is one of the reasons why a lot of our relative sea level curves are somewhat poorly constrained. 
Uh, but we also, we don't just use the visual assessment, of course, we look at macrofossils and microfossils uh, to differentiate these, these intervals. Okay, and then of course, during our transgressions, we, we also have ingression contacts or we sometimes see ingression contacts in our cores. So and the, the core shown in the photo on the left shows the, this isolation sequence with the marine clay or silt at the bottom followed by the brackish and freshwater lake sediments. And then we, we go through that in reverse and come back to the marine silts overlying that. So that's our evidence of a transgression, uh, which we can date and we can determine the elevation uh, or the, yeah, the elevation for the sea level index point. Okay, so that was the past sea level in Norway. Let's move on to present day rates of of sea le a relative sea level in Norway. Of course, we have a tide gauge network and it's been active. Uh, well, uh, some tide gauges have been active for a hundred years or more and others are more recent. Um, but really just what I wanna show you um, on the left is what's going on with, with sea level uh, currently in Norway. And um, I've got two maps um, showing two different time series, 1960 to 2010 and 1984 to 2014. The red arrows show areas where relative sea level is rising according to the tide gauges and the blue areas show where it's still falling. Um, and co-located with, uh, or actually co-located, but also in a network across Norway, we, we have a GPS network, which is measuring the vertical movement of the crust. Um, so that's the GIA contribution to relative sea level rise or fall in Norway today. And that's, that's shown in the figure on the right. Um, so this is vertical land motion from our GPS measurements. The colored dots indicate the millimeters per year and the, the black or the grayscale ones show the air on those. But you can see that along coastal Norway, we've, we've got um, the, the land mass is uh, still uplifting at rates of between one and five millimeters per year. And we also have some new data from INSAR, um, we've got INSAR data, which is really beautiful and freely available to everyone in Norway. It's just on a website that's actually shown in this slide. So you can go and, and look at it if you're interested. And here we're measuring much more precise um, vertical uh, movements of, of the Earth's crust here. The green dot, the, it's mostly green in Norway, which is, a, is basically almost no movement or very, very little movement, which, which fits with the one to five millimeters per year measured um, with the GPS network. But you can click on any of these dots and you can get a five-year time series. So we're only five years now um, with this data, but uh, as time goes on, it, it will help us uh, or improve um, our projections of future sea level change. Because the nice, the fun thing that we can do with, with having both the, the relative sea level data from the tide gauges plus uh, the vertical land motion data or the, um, we call this a geo correction, is that you can subtract that vertical land motion from the relative sea level um, uh, rates recorded by the tide gauges, and then we can we can take that that part of the sea level equation out, and we can say, okay. So if you look at the red dots in this figure, um, we've taken away the vertical land motion component of sea level change here, and you can see that it's relative sea level, or sorry, not relative sea level change up and down the coast of Norway, and, and its cities listed on on the left here. It's not the same everywhere. And, and that's interesting because um, then we can ask why, why is it not? Are these changes, um, you know, what are these changes or these differences related to? And so I'll just remind you again, you know, how, how what goes into relative sea level rise. Of course, I, at the beginning, I said it's mostly GIA um, related to the former glaciation of, of this part of the world. But there, there are a lot more things going on now that become more interesting, especially when our vertical land motion or our GIA is, is much, much smaller. So we've got uh, our, on the right, we've got our, our change in relative sea level is equal to the change in sea surface height, which is a product of all of these, these, um, um, these different elements shown on the image on the left. 
So we've got meltwater from glaciers, and it's even more complicated than that because we've got the gravitational effects, which I alluded to earlier, density changes, temperature changes, and so on, minus our vertical land motion. So if we want to, our modelers to start looking at um, scenarios and understanding you know, that, that sea surface height part of the equation, um, we need to remove that, the GIA. Okay, and as far as future relative sea level rise goes in Norway, well, we, I just showed you tide gauge evidence that it is already rising in, in some places. And I've got some photos of what that actually looks like at the coast here um, to show you later. But, um, but th th these are some maps um, of projections for the future to, uh, to, to, uh, for 2081 to 2100 over um, 1986 to 2005 levels. Um, uh, for different um, representative concentration pathways. So it's, I think it's RCP 2.6 in A and 8.5 in C and 4.5 in B. Um, you can see that we, we are right now, I mean, there are some big unknowns with how the ice sheets are going to behave under um, projected global warming and so on. But right now we're looking at within, certainly with the errors, we're, we're looking at up to a meter in some places. Okay, and as I said, there are some unknowns that I don't want to uh, speculate on and that's um, uh, how people are gonna behave, what representative concentration pathway we're gonna follow and then how also how the ice sheets and glaciers are going to respond to warming. Um, but, but then I also um, want to just quickly discuss um, for the Norway situation, how gravitational um, effects um, related to the, sh the melting of the big ice sheets should, are expected to impact the coast of Norway. And the reason why I want to go over this is because these are some of the questions you can ask or start looking at um, when you remove the, the GIA from the sea level equation. And so um, if Greenland were to melt rapidly in the, in the future, um, what, how would that impact, uh, what, what effect would that have on, on relative sea level rise in Norway? Well, because Norway is in, I guess, or most of Norway is, is sort of in the near field of Greenland, we'll actually experience a, a fall in relative sea level just related to, to melting of Greenland because of the loss of gravitational attraction to the Greenland ice sheet. And Norway's close enough that we will we will get a little bit of that um, attenuation of rise from other factors. So Greenland melting is not an, an you know, it's not too scary for Norway. It may be scary for climate reasons, but for sea level, it's not too scary. But Antarctica melting, we're in the red zone. Norway's fully in the red zone because we are, we are quite far distant from Antarctica. Um, and so um, that uh, loss of gravitational attraction around the Antarctic ice sheets due to loss of mass and addition of meltwater to the world's oceans, that's got to rise somewhere else. And that somewhere else is um, partly Norway. So that's the one that we have to worry about here. Um, okay, and the, uh, these are just a couple of projections showing you how, the range of where we can get to. For, for two places, Stavanger um, and Bergen, these are, these are places in Norway where we expect the most sea level rise in, in the future. And these are, of course, the colors indicate the different RCP projections. And then um, the gold um, line on the curves are the, is the tide gauge data. Okay. So let's get to Quancy, the project that I'm excited to start working on. The primary objective of Quancy is um, to improve century scale relative sea level projections for Norway. Um, one of the tasks for the entire group is to develop a new um, relative sea level database for Norway, so where we combine older data plus new data that we are collecting or generating. And it's divided into three working groups. Working group one it focuses on the recent record and it's in red. You can see some of the locations in Norway where we plan to work and then the parts of the, the, these sort of um, idealized relative sea level curves for Norway um, overlaying on the map here, the, the red square. So we're gonna focus on the recent part of the record, what's happened in these past 2000 years with 
falling or rising relative sea level. And also um, where we have offshore low stands um, with a transgression following, you know, what, what does that transgression look, look like when we, when we look at the actual sediments that record it? Um, working group two is going to focus on earlier transgressions, so the Younger Dryas and the Tapas transgressions, um, to try and elucidate the origin of past relative sea level rise and its impact on the coast. And um, the reason that we're focused on the transgressions is because transgressions are part of Norway's future, and we would like to uh, get our modelers who form working group three to not, not only um, or not only get our modelers to improve their projections for future sea level rise in Norway, but also understand the, the coastal impacts of uh, relative sea level rise at different rates. So we have paleo analogs um, during at least two different occasions in the past in Norway. And we'd like to extract more data from these records and compare it to the present day and use that data to anticipate what might happen in the future, how our coast might respond. And the modelers are, um, yeah, so they're gonna be improving estimates of present day vertical land motion using a new RSL database that we are creating, as I mentioned, and they're working on new GEA models as well. Um, and they're really all about quantifying the magnitude and uncertainty of GEA to, to sea level projections over not just to 2100, but the next few centuries. Okay, so our database, we've got over a thousand sea level index points now spanning the entire Norwegian coast. Um, a lot of our sea level index points are radiocarbon date with some better, some worse, um, um, I guess, uh, elevation uh, of, or former sea level stand associated with that. Uh, we include a, a Kurt Lambeck um, wrote an article or, or created a database in 1998 for Norway. So we've got all of that data plus most of the data published in international journals up to last year. Uh, we're missing still some, some gray literature and some, some data from masters and PhD theses. But we're following the Halsey template, which I'm sure some of you know what Halsey is. It's sort of associated with policy, uh, Holocene sea level database for the whole world um, for the modelers. So we're sort of like a Halsey for Norway. Um, and when you look at the distribution of the ages um, from deglaciation to present, we have a lot more deglacial ages than for the mid to late Holocene. But this is in, not very surprising since a lot of our um, um, data was collected from ice contact shorelines in order to date um, these I, former ice sheet margins and, and determine um, the date of deglaciation and the, the pattern and, and the timing of subsequent deglaciation. So that, that's why the distribution looks that way, but I hope to change it uh, with this project a little bit. Uh, this is just a, a, a clip, a, a screen grab from the Halsey website, just in case um, you were interested, but they do have very similar um, goals to our Quancy project and, and we'll, we're working with them and we will contribute our database to their database um, by follow, they have a very specific um, um, format for the database. So we, we plan to follow that as well for ours. Okay, so the workflow is a classic um, uh, data people, modeling people working together. So the geologists uh, work on the left, we're going to collect, uh, reconstruct more sea level histories and the modelers are gonna work on their models and then we're gonna, they're gonna hindcast, uh, make hindcasts for relative sea level in Norway and we're gonna do data model comparisons, but we're going to specifically focus on the transgressions, try and really constrain those better than they have been. Um, and then also on the, the most recent um, period, the last 2000 years ago, whether sea level is rising in, in, that, the location, in that location or not, but trying to just further constrain that, that recent relative sea level history. So working group one is what I'm um, leading, uh, although I'm also working in working group two. And our primary objective, as I said, is to develop high resolution records of relative sea level change from 2000 years for the last 2000 years. 
And we're going to try and do that by focusing on salt marshes and low elevation basins. Um, and that's because of the problem I mentioned with the isolation basins, you need a lot of basins and they're not always available to get enough sea level index points to create to get that resolution or that detail that we're after. Um, and we hope to integrate the salt marsh relative sea level data with tide gauge records to just extend that instrumental record back and more precisely constrain relative sea level changes in that time period. And then we're also interested in characterizing recent changes in the biogeochemistry of coastal sediments to compare with earlier Holocene transgression records. So we're looking for signatures of uh, in all kinds of different um, uh, elements of, uh, of a coastal sedimentary sequence. Um, yeah. Um, I've got examples coming up. So some of the research questions and hypotheses um, that I want to explore, I have a new PhD student who's specifically funded by this project and he, he will be working on these. Um, so what we know now is that, and I've shown you many examples, that all geologically reconstructed relative sea level curves in Norway show relative sea level falling to modern uh, sea level or mean, modern mean sea level, but Tide gauges indicate that um, relative sea level has been rising since their installation in some areas. Um, so uh, what is the timing of the onset of the modern transgression in these areas where our tide gauges are recording uh, transgression or rising relative sea level? Um, and a hypothesis to test is that recent relative sea level rise has altered nearshore terrestrial organic carbon fluxes, primary productivity, benthic ecology, and coastal sediment dynamics. Uh, recent changes in coastal systems are similar to those observed during early transgressions, such as the tapas. And then a uh, little more experimental, but related to this idea of sea level fingerprinting related to um, gravitational changes um, of melting ice sheets and ice caps. If we subtract uh, our glacial isostatic adjustment from our recent sea level records, are there trends in, in sea level change that reflect Little Ice Age um, growth and retreat of glaciers and ice caps? So the Little Ice Age was this, as you know, I'm sure the a cold period, at least up here. I'm not sure if the Little Ice Age was manifest in Israel or not, but um, it occurred between the 16th and 19th centuries. And um, certainly on Svalbard um, and Greenland, there was significant growth and retreat of, of ice caps and glaciers. And it would be very interesting if, if we could see that in our, our um, relative sea level curves um, over that time period. And what I would expect is that since we're in the near field of Greenland and Svalbard, I would expect that um, rates of regression or falling relative sea level would be augmented by the Little Ice Age. Um, be, uh, uh, particularly the, um, the retreat of, of Little Ice Age glaciers and ice caps because of the loss of gravitational attraction, Norway being in the near field. Um, and uh, I think that would only augment ongoing rates of relative sea level fall. So that's something to experiment with, to see, to work with our modelers on. Okay, the approach for working group one, um, this is one sea level curve in, in Norway that is not, um, that I know of, that it has not used the isolation basin method. This is up in Lofoten. Um, and this looked in a salt marsh um, sedimentary sequence up there and looked at foraminifera and testate amoebae. And um, the forams didn't work so well because um, they couldn't get a modern analog. Uh, so their transfer functions didn't work and hence the large error bars, but the test data amoebae worked really well. Um, you can see those in the close up on the lower figure with the, the boxes. They indicate uh, that the vertical error on these sea level index points from the test data amoebae um, are on the order of 10, maybe 15 centimeters max. So it's, it's pretty good. And, and the red squiggly line on that is on the lower curve is the tide gauge record. So there's a fairly 
uh, it's fairly consistent with what was observed or, or recorded by the, the test data MIBE. So this is the approach that we will take in working group one, where possible, the salt, hence the salt marsh, targeting salt marshes, but also low, really low or even intertidal basins. Um, so I've had one master's student so far working on this project and he, he began before this project was funded. So it was just like, let's see what we can do and how, how, do we have any friends with labs? Um, and he worked at this site in Southern Norway. This is really almost southernmost Norway. It's, um, there's a nice real enclosed, uh, well, it's not a pond, sorry, a bay, but it's quite enclosed, but it is, is fully marine uh, with a fringing salt marsh. It's got a bedrock sill at two meters below sea level. Um, a core was taken um, just outside of the marsh in the basin, and there's clear evidence of um, the isolation following the Younger Dryas transgression, that's the arrow down at the bottom, YDH, and then uh, we go through that isolation contact into a freshwater pond. So this little marine embayment was once um, isolated from the sea. And, and then we get another transgression, probably the toughest transgression above that. Uh, and then it, rem it remains um, connected to the open or to the sea, uh, i.e. not isolated um, until recent. And so my master's student though was trying to, to find evidence of increasing marine influence just in the last um, 100, 200 years or so, uh, because we have tide gauge records from this area, I think I, yeah, they're here, that indicate that, that since the tide gauge records have been installed, um, relative sea level has been rising in this area. So these are the two closest tide gauge records. These are, I think it's a 30 year moving average shown. Um, and these actually go back much farther in time, but um, for this, the, I think the data beyond 1960 is not necessarily reliable. Um, but uh, let me just try and go back here. Yeah, so uh, you've got a hill shade model on the right or the left showing the location of the, the core and then um, people with the Russian core uh, taking the, the sample um, and the, the parts of this marsh that are flooded uh, regularly by the tides is indicated by the arrow C. And then there's a white line um, that um, shows the margin of, of the parts of the marsh that are regularly flooded by the tide and those above which only experience the storm tides uh, or storm surges. Okay. Um, so this, this was, uh, we were a little bit unlucky, I guess, uh, with this study. It, it worked out okay, but I think we need more data. And now we have this project, so we're going to go back. But uh, my student, Oscar, he, um, he mostly focused on the top two meters um, of core that were collected from this site. He looked, he wanted to do uh, foraminifera, but preservation was a real problem here. And I think this marsh is quite acidic. Um, but he did find agglutinated foraminifera um, like Millimina fusca and um, Yadamina macrescens, I think, um, throughout the full two meters. So it certainly had some marine to brackish influence um, over that period of time. Um, we looked at XRF or we scanned the cores for uh, XRF and magnetic susceptibility. And I won't go into too much detail. We have some radiocarbon dates. He also had some luck with lead. We didn't do lead to 10 dating, but uh, in Norway, I think most of the lead that you find in sedimentary sequences is atmospherically deposited. So um, based on the pattern of, of lead um, in parts per million, he was he made some assumptions about um, uh, what periods of, or atmospheric, uh, sorry, pollution fallout of lead. So things like um, peak leaded gasoline usage or the coal industry peak, for example. And he combined that with his um, radio, it, and, or sorry, it fit with the radiocarbon data, but this, this data needs to be modeled still um, in, or incorporated into a proper age model. And we just got some new radiocarbon dates back for this, for this core. Um, he also looked at um, things like uranium um, as a proxy for uh, organic matter content because uranium absorbs um, readily to peat. 
uh, versus titanium, which is um, more of a mineralogenic um, sediment uh, proxy. Uh, he looked at accretion rates and he also looked at macrofossils to determine whether we were in a reed swamp um, or a salt marsh, for example. And based on this data, um, he determined that um, that uh, accretion rates began to rise around 160 years before present or 1858 AD. Um, and that's compatible with his titanium and uranium uh, records in the XRF data and with his vegetation zone data. And so that is his best or our best estimate at, for the onset of, um, I guess the relative sea level rise for this, for this site in Norway. Um, and so, um, but there were some issues um, in the hillshade map that I showed you. I didn't point it out, but there, there's certainly some evidence of anthropogenic activity in this area. So things like ditches um, uh, cut into the marsh to drain it, um, and maybe um, some harvesting of grasses, and, and maybe there were livestock. And so all of these things can affect the mineralogenic sedimentation. And so the next step would be to, to go to a marsh nearby that perhaps doesn't have as much anthropogenic activity associated with it, or maybe a few marshes, and compare the records. So, so that's sort of where we're at with that project. I, uh, last year, I went to the same area and I, I collected some gravity cores and, and um, Russian cores uh, from a, an intertidal basin here called Saltoshana. Um, it's, it's got a really nice um, intertidal sill um, that we were able to measure or survey precisely. It's probably at or very close to high tide. Um, we've just started analysis on those cores. Um, oh, this is my other PhD student surveying the sill in. This is what it looks like. It, it's really just bedrock, so that's quite nice. Uh, we don't have to worry, or we can, we can be very confident of this, the sill depth. This is what um, one of the Russian cores looked like. Uh, not sure what's going on. We've certainly got storm layers. Um, you can kind of see these shelly layers um, here and here. And I did some, um, I'm using the CT scanner at the Earth Lab at the University of Bergen. And this is what one of the storm layers look like, looks like the red, um, uh, the red fragment or the red uh, part of this image um, represents shell fragments. And then we also see this in the, uh, the XRF data and so on, but that's, that's a work in progress. So I'll quickly go through working group two, and then I think I'm, I'm basically out of time. Uh, working group two had the primary objectives again of reconstructing these former transgressions um, in Norway. And so they started because uh, the working group, most of the working group two people uh, or the leader of the project and the leader of working group two are both at the Geological Survey of Norway. And so they always have funding to go out and do field work. And, and they've been working on this um, since 2018. Um, and I'm going to show you some of their work from southern Norway. They've poured 20 basins and they've identified 35 sea level index points. So their approach to overcome the uh, problem with resolution on these relative sea level curves was to just core a heck of a lot of basins. And that's what they did. Um, and so they've got some more resolution on them, uh, ultimately. So we'll go to Kristiansand, and that's in almost southernmost Norway. And here they found a lovely cluster of basins that um, contained record, sedimentary records of a lot of things they were looking for and some things that I'm looking for. So they've got the Younger Dryas transgression in nine of them. That's the black circled areas. They've got the early Holocene tapas transgression uh, recorded in the, um, the yellow, um, the yellow uh, within the yellow circle and then the late Holocene, they got some, they, they've got some more um, sea level index points um, in the blue circles. So this is one of the relative sea level uh, curves that they were able to put together. So you can see um, the uh, post Younger Dryas um, 
rapid uh, fall in relative sea level followed by the equally rapid, probably rapid rise in uh, during the tapas transgression. But again, we're still struggling with the depth of the low stand and to some degree, the timing of the low stand. So we need to keep working on that. <clears throat> followed by regression to modern, but here, there aren't, we don't have good control on the vertical errors on the sill depths here, but there is some evidence that there is a bit of a speed up in the rate of relative sea level fall in the last 2000 years. So starting around 1500, 1600 years before present, uh, suddenly relative sea level is falling a lot faster than, than previously. And so then we're, we will hope to take this question to our modelers to ask why can they can they um, can they account for this by looking at uh, little ice age um, growth and retreat of glaciers in in the near field or maybe in the well the near field makes the most sense but we but before we do that we need more control on the sea level index points in in terms of the elevation okay. Um, then just waiting for my next slide. There we go. Then we can move over to, I think, Lista to the west. Yeah. And here again, uh, we've got a bit better vertical control on um, during the, the, um, the last 2000 years during that regression and maybe <laughs> Maybe we see this this transition, but we need more data still in those la the the most recent thousand years to really understand what's what's been happening with sea level. But we've got better control over here during the tapas transgression, I think, especially on the trans the rapidly transgressive part of that record. <clears throat> and then finally, um, over at Tvedestrand, which is east of Kristiansand. Um, we have uh, more, a little more control on our um, tapas transgression, and then again in the, the late Holocene with this change in the rate of, of sea level fall. And we, we're looking at different proxies um, in, during these, these transgressions, and this is an example of one where we're looking at the ratio of calcium to iron and sulfur to calcium through this isolation interval. So what you're looking at on um, the, the core on the bottom is showing the brackish interval. And then the uh, to the left is the overlying freshwater interval. And what we see, we see this clear signal um, that is reflecting um, um, uh, re reduced conditions um, during the brackish phase. And, um, and changes in calcium. And I think I've got a better, yeah, brackish fresh. And then here in another core, um, we've got the full interval. So we've got, um, again, a nice clear signal from the marine where we've got more calcium, um, but also some sulfur um, and, uh, and then in through the brackish and, and ultimately into the fresh water. So it's a, it's a nice signal and we're gonna look for this in um, our recent records as well and in other transgressive records that we, that we collect. Okay. Okay, so lastly, I just wanna say, if you're wondering, I mean, we're not the Seychelles, we're not going underwater anytime soon. Why on earth would someone worry about sea level rise in Norway? Um, especially when you think of Norway like this, um, these steeply sided fjords. Uh, Norway has a lot of coastal infrastructure like the, uh, the Atlantic Highway here, a lot. Um, there was one study um, that calculated or determined that there are 110,000 buildings at one meter above present sea level or lower. And to move or, or, or make changes to these buildings to accommodate future sea level is going to cost 725 million euros. And that's just buildings. We've also got an enormous aquaculture, fishing and oil and gas industries here, all of which rely on coastal um, ports and, and infrastructure, a lot of tourism, or at least we used to, um, bridges, tunnels, roads, and so on. The small communities in Norway are all very well connected by these bridges and tunnels um, to the rest of Norway. 
Um, and also, as you know, sea level rise, as I said, with the tide gauge data, it's ongoing. This is Stavanger, um, probably during some kind of king tide um, storm surge event, but it's already flooding. Same thing is happening in, even in Trondheim, where relative sea level is still falling. We are not rising. This picture uh, was taken in February, almost exactly one year ago. During a storm surge, although it doesn't really look like much of a low pressure system overhead in this photo, but um, during a, a bit of a storm surge in combination with a king tide, uh, part of the cycle, and this is a parking lot um, down on the fjord that's flooded. And uh, Bergen, it's got its own reasons for sea level rise, not least that the parts of the city are actually sinking due to um, changes to uh, subterranean uh, drainage. But um, in any case, it's going to be expensive and potentially dangerous. And so, and com these communities rely on these projections. And so that's, that's our, our main goal with Quancy is to, um, to improve those projections for the future by, by um, improving uh, our understanding of the past. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Antel. Uh... Uh, so I open the podium for um, questions or from the people, since I don't see everybody. So just jump in with questions. It would be good. Mm -hmm. Complex. Yeah, it's it. Go ahead. You, you, <clears throat> Hi, first of all, uh... Thank you. It was a fascinating talk, definitely. <coughs> I'm sorry. Beautiful, uh, beautiful data. Um, beautiful project, beautiful scenery. Nice Norway. Um, one question I have is, is you never mentioned even by a hint, a historical or archaeological evidence. Yeah. Why? <laughs> uh, well, because I think I was already too long, um, but there is um, certainly some, it's not, the archaeologists are quite active and they work with um, one of the members of our team, and work, uh, the leader of working group too, quite often on, um, on sea, past sea level uh, change. And so what I know about um, archaeological sites in Norway uh, with respect to sea level change is I know that some sites have been buried by um, the tapas transgression. So um, they're buried by beach gravels and things like that. Um, uh, but there's still evidence of occupation of close to the sea during that period of time. Um, but maybe abandonment of sites um, and moving inland with that transgression. Um, and then there, um, there are also uh, this low stand, which is a real problem. And it's something that I would like to get into uh, myself in my working group um, are, there are a few sites in Norway and I had a slide, but I took it out, I shouldn't have. Um, where we have Mesolithic sites uh, up to 10 meters or so below um, present sea level. And uh, we've got peat layers indicating that sea level, there was a low stand. And then we've also got, um, I think human remains and artifacts um, associated with those layers. So we, we do have those. I think there are some parts uh, of Norway, not too far from me, where there might be some archaeological evidence or archaeological um, sites that give some indication of a former sea level, things like fishing weirs, but I'm, I'm not, not really sure about that. Um, and then we have some sites, I think, in caves, in coastal caves, um, in sedimentary sequences where uh, the caves have been flooded and um, I think during the Mesolithic and, and these, these cultural layers or, or archeological sites are buried by, by, the, um, um, by marine sediments in the caves. But uh, to be, I'm not really, sh I mean, this is something that should go into the database, I would think if, but I, I really haven't heard much about an, a sea level index point 
based on an archaeological site or or um, something related to to archaeology. I, I, I don't know of any, but definitely worth looking into. I have I have a question, and this is that really. Um, oh, oh no. Yeah, we hear you. Not sure if you can. It's coming and going. Your sound. <clears throat> Maybe if you can write the question, Beverly. We, I we can't couldn't, hear you all that. Yeah, we I couldn't just, hear you. Perhaps if you can write it in the chat. I don't I don't know if she heard us. We'll find out. Okay. Um I have a question from the meanwhile. Again, I wanted to say thank you very much. I mean it's incredible your talk. It's really fantastic. Um Okay, there is a question, but I will ask mine. <laughs> about your XRF data, I wanted to know, I have two questions about the XRF data. Um, you are presenting PPM, part per million, I guess. Is this, um, so I guess it's a uh, quantitative. Do you, because usually I, I, I know the data like uh, CPS, like count per second. So I don't know if you have okay. that to, I mean, you have transformed the data into a, uh, part per million basically right yeah okay. well it was for me <laughs> yeah but i on a, for, i mean i worked with xrf data a little bit um i have sort of a love hate relationship with it it's it's a bit like um falling into the into the or falling through the looking glass or, or something like that i can really get lost in it but it's very complicated and there's always there are so many local factors to explain all the trends and things but um i've always worked with it in in ppm that but i i've never processed it myself i've just been handed the data so i'm not sure i can answer right. your question but That's if you if, i mean i'm interested to hear more about problems with that but no, because I'm familiar with that and I was um, surprised a little bit. Um, and another question is about the lead. Uh, actually, um, actually, last week uh, I submitted a paper from a lake in Norway. <laughs> I hope what? it will be accepted. And we had a lot of discussion with the lead issue because um, Apparently the lead, I'm not a lead expert, but this is not a question, it's more um, a suggestion also. I, you, you showed a graph, graphs with lead, right? The pigs. Yeah. yeah. So our lead person ex expert was um, saying that there probably there is a migration of the lead. So um, it could migrate between the sediment and it will, um migrate to more coarse particle units if you have already yes. silt and above not mud and it will get stuck over there so it probably will influence your um suggestion for a chronology okay in case so just take into consideration that it can be very tricky absolutely that. that's that's really good to know i think we're safe there because we have no coarse sediments in that particular site but i do have um, clear storm layers and um coarser grain size layers uh from some of my other core sites but we do now that now that i have funding <laughs> um we're actually going to do the the, the lead 210 we're going to we're going to analyze our sediments for that not rely on the xrf that was um just sort of what you do when you uh, don't have funding yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Master has this data and we just worked with it and it seemed to fit but um, I didn't know about the migration to coarser grain sizes that's it's uh, a very okay. tricky I think yeah. that an entire week would spend only for that discussion and argument because it's very very tricky and well, also take into consideration good. about the lead to 10 that you are planning to do take into consideration that Norway has a huge like really huge amount of lead to 10 after the Chernobyl. 
so but the measurements are than... going really high yeah yeah more than normal and then that thing also you need to argue somehow to the people well, that they are expert in that yeah absolutely we are hoping to use different pollution dating markers if we can so copper and lead uh nickel um well also look at cesium-137, lead-210, and we're going to look, we're going to use the CT scanner and maybe the XRF to see if there's any indication of tephras, because there are lots of tephra yeah. or crypto tephras in Norway. So we're going, to, we're going to try and look for those as well. The problem with my working group working in this very recent time period is that it's tough to date. So I have to rely, we're going to have to rely on a lot of different um methods of age determination we will probably work um with a woman at antenu on the bomb curve as well and and do some of the radiocarbon uh, bomb curve dating so cool yeah cool um there is a question from beverly um why is the contact in course at isolation so sharp yeah uh that is such a good question bev except you have to leave for hockey and that's too bad, but I support hockey. So, uh, okay, I, I can try and answer that question. Um, why do we get this sudden switch from, from the marine silt to the, the brackish? It's so clear and it's so sharp. And uh, actually, I'm not really sure. Um, I think once, um, once you reach some threshold with respect to where that... Um, where that's when that sill is in that intertidal zone somewhere there uh, then suddenly um, I think the anoxic um, conditions really take over and I and I think I think that helps to make it look more sharp um, to, because of the the reduced condition the switch from from um, from the open marine to the reduced conditions. I think that's why. It's not erosional or anything like that. Um, I, think it's, I think it's the color change and I think it's related to the geochemistry, but um, that's a super question. And it made me think of something else and now I've lost it. <laughs> but anyway. I hope, I hope she heard. <laughs> yeah, I think she did. She, she made another, I've got the chat up here, so that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, are, are there more questions? Obviously, I don't see any, everybody, so just pop in. Mm. No questions. No questions. Well, I guess uh, that's oh, it. Somebody's waving. Uh, you saw yeah, I, I'd like to ask another question. How sure are you that the uh, well, it sort of touches that same uh, issue. You're talking about the contact being a uh, uh, change in habitat, basically, of the lake. Uh, how sure are you that it's in Kronos across the entire lake? Uh, did you try to investigate it? We're not, and it shouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to be. Now, these basins are quite small. Uh, most of them, they're not large at all. Um, and the, we tend to go for, uh, we use our sub bottom profiler and find where the thickest package of marine sedi or sediments are for coring, of course. Um, but we also, depending on access to these places, will often go in at the margin where you've got your fringing marsh and take the, take the core there. Or if we have ice, we like to core through the ice, it's an excellent coring platform. Um, then we can go farther out into the basin um, uh, or we can do it by raft. We've got a coring raft as well. So, so no, that's a really good question. Those edge effects actually mean a lot, but in my working group, I'm hoping to do this sort of thing, taking a transect across a basin and looking at the changes in the micro um, flora and fauna and the geochemistry, um, and then the you know the basic sedimentary physical properties, I guess, um, and getting the whole picture of what's really happening. I mean, it's that brackish interval, to be honest. That's that's the most interesting to me because when you look at things like the XRF that I showed uh, very briefly at the end, um, 
it's not just a simple, suddenly we're brackish and anoxic. There, there are marine tendencies that are going back and forth, more marine to less marine throughout that brackish interval. And then suddenly we switch, we cross some threshold and we switch to fully isolated, fully fresh, where the waters are turning over, they're no longer anoxic and so on. But, um, but I think that um, I would like to explore these brackish intervals in, during these past transgressions and look at some of the some of these um, different elements of the sedimentary sequences in that interval and compare those to the places along the coast where relative sea level is rising because we're sort of in that brackish interval um, in, in these low elevation coastal basins where we know that sea level's rising. So they were at their low stand and now suddenly they're getting more marine influence. So I think it'd be, I think it could be really interesting to see how the, how things fluctuate and what um, during that, that period of time, the, this brackish phase and uh, yeah, how that looks in, in, in different, uh, through, through different proxies, I guess. Yeah, I've, I've looked uh, at the Sea of Marmara and, and it looks the same in the Sea of Marmara. It's quite amazing, the different scale. Uh, the Sea of Marmara also has this marine, uh, this marine uh, deposits and then boof, and then there is a, a, a land deposits on, on top of it, which means that the, the, that the seal was, uh, that the seal was cut off, that, that the sea was cut off and, and that's interesting. Yeah, amazing. There are papers from that people investigated that uh, yeah. you might want to look at that. It's really interesting. Oh, really? Yeah, that is very interesting. Huge water body, but yeah. it is the uh, same idea. It rem I, I were also, I mean, I'm a coastal geomorphologist as well, myself. I mean, that's a lot of my background is in coastal geomorphology. And I'm also interested in those threshold changes. I mean, with these raised beaches, for example, um, you know, why, you know, what, what do they really represent? Why are the, they, why do they form these beautiful staircase patterns? I mean, I think it's the last major storm before sea level fell to an, another level, or, but it certainly has something to do with the, the storm interval and how that's changed over time. And it's not a simple case of assuming a, a linear, um, rate of sea level change, you know, going from the lowest to the highest raised beach, for example. So connecting the geomorphology to these coastal basins is um, also something we can do, especially in northern Norway, where a lot of that is preserved really nicely. So. Uh, I, I think it's also important for uh, understanding what change looks like. Yes, yeah, the paleo coastal... I see that we are going to cross steps along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Antel. Um, I think we need to we need to close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you will receive a present from us. So I'm yeah, excited. be ready. Yeah. Okay. So um, and if you want to be in uh, in our mailing list for future talks, if you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. It sounds like you have a fun series going. So uh, if I can join in, if I'm not absolutely. teaching, then I will. No, absolutely, yeah. you can join in whenever you want. And we will have more Norwegians, by the way. Oh, excellent. Through your connection, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thank okay. you very much. And thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.